for those of you who don't know uh, about the Center for Election Science, maybe this is one of your first events that you've attended. Um, the Center for Election Science is a nonpartisan nonprofit, and we are dedicated to empowering people with voting methods uh, that strengthen democracy. And so the main voting method that we advocate for is called approval voting, and it allows you to vote for as many candidates on your ballot as you like, and the candidate with the most votes wins. Um, we helped folks in Fargo, North Dakota, and St. Louis, Missouri to implement approval voting in their cities. And we're working with activists across the country um, who want to bring it to their communities. Um, so if that sounds like something that you're interested in, you can check us out at electionscience.org. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on campaign finance. So we have a special guest today with us, Pete Quist. He is the Deputy Research Director at Open Secrets. Um, he joined Open Secrets in the 2021 merger between the Center for Responsive Politics and the National Institute. Oops. Sorry, somebody's... Oops, still unmuted here. Sorry, one moment. I think I got it. Oh, thank you. You bet. Okay. Um, so he, he joined uh, Open Secrets in the 2021 merger between the Center for Responsive Politics and the National Institute on Money in State Politics. And Pete had been the research director at NIMP since 2013 after serving five years as a researcher. At NIMP, he focused on best practices for disclosure of money in state politics. Before joining the Institute in 2008, Pete spent two years at Project Vote Smart, where he tracked the progress of congressional and state legislation, summarized key bills in plain language, and compiled voting records. Pete earned a Bachelor of Political Science from South Dakota State University. So thank you so much for being here, Pete. We're very happy to have you. Um, is there anything you'd like to like to say before I hand it over to you? I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking awesome. forward to this conversation. Yeah, I'm really excited. I think, uh, like I've mentioned to you before, we have had really good response from folks on this. I think this uh, campaign finance is a hot topic right now. People are really interested in um, understanding how money is influencing policies, government, the candidates who get elected, all of that kind of stuff. So um, we're really excited to hear what you have to say and I'll let you, I'll let you take it from here. Great, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and start off with a few slides and then we're going to go to some uh, live website action to take a look at uh, some data. Uh, so as Caitlin mentioned, uh, I came from the National Institute on Money and Politics, and we merged with the Center for Responsive Politics to form Open Secrets. Uh, both organizations and the new organization have always, for decades now, uh, collected campaign finance and lobbying data and made that freely available on their websites. And the idea here is that we can uh, collect this data from various government agencies where it is available in different kinds of formats, um, sometimes in handwritten uh, pieces of paper, even, uh, which we get shipped to us in the mail and actually get into our database. Uh, so we're aggregating all this stuff together for folks um, and putting it into one usable database um, from lots of different places. Uh, so we've got um, reports that we publish. Uh, we have a little, uh, we have a journalism arm uh, that is constantly writing um, pieces that are, that are disseminated. You can sign up for, for those newsletters. Uh, we do long-term analysis uh, every, um, every election cycle. Uh, and we can try to put the data into usable tools as well. And I'll be going over some of those um, on this too. Uh, the, what I'm gonna talk about today are uh, the ways, the common ways in which campaign finance um, can be uh, regulated. And so we'll touch on, on the three main approaches to that, uh, what the goals are uh, and how they work. Uh, and then we'll also talk about uh, trends in campaign finance and elections uh, around the country and get into uh, what those are looking like and how those regulations might impact some of those trends. And then the last thing we'll do is take a look at a couple of the tools that we use to uh, try to allow people to see what's actually happening, um, particularly in their states when they're trying to uh, advocate for, for change uh, on any variety of issues. We try to make the data come to life in terms of good governance. So. So there are three main avenues uh, of spending in politics uh, that I'm going to talk about here today. One of them is contributions to candidates and committees. 
And this is what most folks typically think about. You see a candidate that you like, uh, you give them a, a contribution for their campaign. That goes into an account that they can use to run for election. And so it, they, they have to log everything uh, that comes in and what comes out uh, and uh, use that money for their own election purposes. Uh, independent spending is another one. This one has really grown uh, in the last 10 years after the Citizens United VFEC decision uh, in 2010. Uh, this uh, refers to spending that a person or a group will do to uh, support or oppose a candidate without actually giving that candidate any money for their, for their race. Uh, oftentimes, these kinds of expenditures are used to disparage a candidate uh, to oppose that candidate for election. Uh, these are typically not run by uh, individuals directly, um, but by uh, organizations, and we'll get into more of that in a little bit. Uh, and then lobbying. So this is the spending directly on um, government policy. And uh, oftentimes this is spent to try to keep a status quo uh, rather than to make a change to government policy. Uh, the three main approaches that we're gonna talk about today on, on regulating this uh, are disclosure, uh, limiting the money and providing public financing. Uh, every state, uh, and I come from a world of mostly state elections and campaign finance, so I'll be focusing primarily on that, uh, but this is also true at the federal level. Uh, all jurisdictions have uh, various approaches to these kinds of, of um, limitations or, or regulations on, on politicking. Uh, disclosure is the uh, approach that has oops, the, let me do this. Um, disclosure is the approach that has uh, the um, most ubiquitous uh, use. So this is the idea that when a candidate runs for office, uh, they must report uh, publicly where they get their money uh, and um, what they're spending it on. Now, similarly, if you are engaging in independent expenditure activity, those ads that support or oppose a candidate without actually coordinating with that candidate, giving that candidate money directly, um, but just doing it on your own, and this is why it's called independent spending, uh, those are subject to disclosure requirements as well of various levels. Uh, and then uh, lobbying uh, in some states is disclosed pretty well. Uh, at the federal level, it's disclosed relatively well compared to many of the states. Um, disclosure isn't really a big challenge in terms of a First Amendment um, free speech uh, restriction. Limits are used pretty widely on contributions to campaigns, but not everywhere. So for example, if you are running for a state government office in Texas, like state legislature or governor, there is no limit on how much somebody can give you to run for office. And so we routinely see uh, contributions of seven figures to uh, gubernatorial candidates in Texas, for example. Uh, only about 11 states don't have limits on contributions right now. Um, most states do, and they vary quite a bit. Uh, here in Montana, if you're running for the state house, uh, the limit is, I think, $170 this year. Um, but in California, maybe thousands of dollars. And then public funding, uh, this is the option to sign up for a program, and this is always going to be an opt-in program as a candidate. Uh, this is where you're talking about, um, you, you, typically what you'll do is get some seed money to indicate that you're a real candidate, uh, and then uh, receive money from the campaign finance agency to run for office. And there are different ways that this um, is implemented, and we'll talk about that in more detail momentarily. These, by the way, uh, the contributions, the independent spending, and the lobbying data are specifically the kinds of data sets that we collect at Open Secrets, and so that's why I'm focusing on them here. There are some other pieces of information that are good to have that we uh, would like to get and are pioneering in some cases, uh, and they include things such as personal financial disclosures, how much uh, money people have tied up in different industries who are in elected office. So the disclosure, uh, as I talked about with candidates running for office, uh, every candidate has to report um, where they get their money and what they spend it on. Uh, if they're running for a federal office, US House, US Senate or President, or if they're running for a state office, uh, and that is true in all states. <clears throat> uh, as of, I think, 2015, uh, North Dakota was the last state to require uh, state candidates to actually disclose what they spend their money on uh, to get elected. Um, independent spending, uh, as I talked about, you, if you make an expenditure on on an ad to support or oppose a candidate, uh, that is almost always required to be reported in, if it is expressly advocating for or against that candidate's election. Um, this uh, has some loopholes in it. Uh, about half of the states don't require you to uh, report what you're spending your money on if the ad does not expressly advocate for or against the candidate for election. And so uh, what we think about here are those ads that have a black and white picture of the candidate, a bunch of lightning in the background, 
and some language about the candidate being terrible on some issue, and that runs right before an election, which is obviously electioneering, um, but is only required to be reported uh, in about half of the states. It is also required to be reported at the federal level. This is also where dark money uh, really comes in. So independent spending uh, is what we're talking about typically with dark money. Uh, and what happened with the Citizens United decision in 2010 uh, was that a nonprofit corporation called Citizens United uh, ran an ad um, to oppose Hillary Clinton for president. And it was actually kind of a, a long form video kind of a thing. But uh, what's important here is that the uh, federal campaign finance restrictions prohibited um, corporations, including nonprofit corporations, from engaging uh, in independent expenditures in this way, uh, from funding them through their treasuries. What you would have to do if you were a corporation or any other kind of an organization is form a political action committee and then have that political action committee be funded exclusively by individuals uh, giving money from their own personal accounts uh, to that political action committee and then that political action committee could run those ads or individuals could do it directly. And that's been true everywhere in the country at the federal level and the state level for forever. Um, the Citizens United ruling uh, specifically uh, allowed corporations and unions to um, fund those kinds of expenditures with their treasuries. At the time that it passed, about half of the states had regulations um, prohibiting corporations and unions from spending their money um, directly on these independent expenditure ads uh, for state campaigns, and about half um, did not. So uh, it only affected about half the states. Montana was the only real holdout. Uh, otherwise, uh, all of the states immediately uh, stopped enforcing their laws uh, after the Citizens United decision, and Montana did about a year later. Uh, the issue with the dark money piece here is that it has now become routine for nonprofit corporations um, to get engaged in this kind of activity, uh, and they don't have to disclose who their donors are. Um, I want to clarify, uh, when many people think of nonprofit corporations, they think specifically of 501c3 nonprofit corporations, which are charities. They're the kinds of corporations that you can give uh, a donation to, and it's a tax write-off kind of a thing. Um, those organizations are not engaging in this way. Um, Open Secrets is one of them. Uh, and uh, what we're talking about here are other kinds of nonprofit corporations, uh, most uh, commonly 501c4 corporations, and this just refers to the paragraph in the tax code. Um, these are social welfare groups uh, that advocate for various issues. Uh, on lobbying, so. oh, go ahead. I, I was just, I was just going to mention someone in the chat did ask what is required to be reported uh, in, in oh, those yeah. disclosures. Yep. I, I'm not sure if you're going to mention that before you before you're at the end of this slide, but oh, this is great. I thought so, that was a good question. It is. So uh, if you're reporting contributions as a candidate, then you're reporting the name of the donor uh, and typically uh, also the uh, street address of the donor uh, and the city and state. And in most jurisdictions, uh, some kind of employment information, what, uh, what their occupation is, and uh, very commonly who their employer is if they're an individual. Uh, for independent spending, uh, what kind of disclosures we're talking about are um, how much money you spent um, as, a, as a group or, or a company or whatever on the ad, uh, who you paid, uh, so who that, who that media firm is, or the USPS or, or whoever it was, um, and of course the date, and usually the candidate that you're supporting or opposing and whether or not you're supporting or opposing that candidate. And this allows us then to look at how much money is actually being spent on a race. Oops. Um, uh, the disclosure piece around lobbying uh, has to do with um, corporations or unions or other organizations that are trying to directly impact um, the political outcome in the legislative session, uh, and they will pay firms or lobbyists to represent them, uh, and this is compensation or salaries, uh, and then those firms or lobbyists will also pay for things like luncheons or other um, events and that sort of thing. Almost all of the money spent on lobbying is paid in that salary component. Uh, paying the firm or paying the lobbyist to represent you. And the more successful or powerful a firm or a lobbyist is uh, or is perceived to be, the more money they can charge to represent clients. Uh, and in practice, the money that is spent in that um, compensation component is between 70 and 90% of the money that, a, that an organization will spend on lobbying. About half of the states don't require that compensation to be reported. Uh, and um, uh, this slide uh, show will be shared with uh, attendees of this webinar uh, after the webinar, and there are some links uh, that you'll see at the bottom here uh, that will take you to nice breakdowns of some of these uh, disclosure requirements. 
uh, as far as limits, uh, what we're talking here primarily are uh, con contribution limits, and so limits on how much you can give directly to a candidate uh, or, or a political committee in many cases. Um, there are a couple of pieces about uh, free speech uh, regulations and jurisprudence around, um, around all of this politicking that we're talking about. Um, there is very strict scrutiny applied to the idea that you can't um, give as much of a message as it a message as you'd like to um, through through limits. So limits don't typically apply to things that are expenditures from a campaign. A campaign can spend as much money on television ads as it would like to, uh, for example. Uh, that would be a direct limit on its speech. Um, but the limit on how much you can give to that campaign, um, because part of the um, political speech that you're doing uh, in that action is associating yourself with that uh, candidate or that committee, um, and that can be done with a limit on there. Uh, it doesn't stand up to as strong of a scrutiny, and so limits are per permissible to campaign contributions, although, again, not applied everywhere. So, uh, independent expenditures, because their expenditures are not subject to any kind of a limitation, so these corporations and unions and any other organizations that would like to uh, get involved in that, in that activity can do so at their leisure uh, and as much as they'd like. And similarly, uh, the amount of money spent on lobbying is not ever subject to any kind of a limitation. Uh, contributions to candidates are limited in most jurisdictions because of the um, aspect of corruption or the appearance of corruption. Uh, independent expenditures, uh, as part of the Citizens United ruling, um, were um, described as the Supreme Court uh, by the Supreme Court as not causing corruption or the appearance of corruption because ostensibly uh, those expenditures are not coordinated with the candidate or the candidate's campaign. Uh, contribution limits have specific impacts. Uh, they don't necessarily reduce the amount of money in elections, although uh, there is some um, data that suggests that they might in certain situations, uh, but it's not a really clear, um, a really clear effect of it. Uh, what it does definitely do is change the contributor pool, uh, and sometimes it makes it so that candidates can uh, raise money uh, more effectively in comparison with their opponents. Uh, specifically, uh, what I'm talking about here are um, the idea that when you get rid of contribution limits, and we actually have a great example of this, Missouri got rid of contribution limits for their state campaigns in the mid 2000s, and then re-implemented them in 2018. Uh, when they got rid of their contribution limits in the mid 2000s, we saw the cost of state legislative races go up about 40%. Uh, and, and what I mean by the cost is how much money uh, legislative candidates were receiving. Contributors came in in a big way. And in fact, about 45% of the money raised by legislative candidates came from 50 individuals. Um, and this is just legislative candidates as a group. So about 50 people were basically um, running the legislative elections. Um, that all went back to normal, uh, including the dollar amounts that the candidates are raising just in general, uh, as soon as the contribution limits were re-implemented. In addition, um, in states without contribution limits or with high contribution limits, uh, we do find that candidates, um, particularly if they're incumbents, tend to have uh, very strong financial advantages over, over their opponents. Uh, if you have low contribution limits, uh, that advantage largely goes away. I'm going to take a moment to click on this link. Uh, this is a great resource uh, to be aware of. Uh, this is from the organization, the Campaign Finance Institute, which became a part of the National Institute of Money and Politics uh, and is now a part of Open Secrets. <clears throat> and this has a breakdown of what contribution limits are in each state. And again, this slideshow will be shared after the presentation, so you'll get this link as well. Uh, but you can get a look at um, states with small contribution limits, for example, versus, versus those with larger ones, or none. There's quite a few states on there with no limits at all. I'm, I'm kind of surprised by of that. Them. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and they come and go. So there, we had 12 for a while and Missouri didn't. And this is actually a really uh, interesting tool in that you can see the historic. Uh, and so this goes back about 20 years. Uh, 2018 is the most recent update we've done to this. We just haven't gotten around to the 2021 yet. Um, but you can see, for example, um, Missouri dropping their limits uh, in the mid 2000s there and then re-implementing it for 2018. Uh, public funding is a really exciting area in campaign finance uh, regulation right now. Um, there are four kinds of public funding programs here. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would have said there are three. Um, the, oldest, uh, the oldest models are the full grant and the partial grant. Uh, these are both cases where you just get money given to you by uh, a state campaign finance agency in a set dollar amount. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Arizona, Connecticut, and Maine have full public funding grants. Uh, what happens is as a candidate, you raise um, some sort of um, set of donations that indicates that you're a legitimate candidate, and that's defined in each state's law. Typically, it's uh, contributions from individuals in the amount of $5 or $10 uh, from a certain number of individuals, either in the state or in your district. Uh, and then you turn that in to the state campaign finance agency. The agency actually usually gets to keep that money uh, and put it into the public funding pot, uh, but then they give you a grant to run for office. Uh, the, the arguments here are that it allows people who do not have very extensive um, uh, social circles to raise money from uh, to run for office because they can get funding to do that um, by raising the seed money. Uh, and, by, uh, and also that um, you take out the uh, contributions from uh, private sources. Uh, the reason that this is called a full grant is because once you sign up to, to do this, and all of these are opt-in programs for each candidate, you don't have to do it. Um, but once you do sign up to do that and you, and you get that public grant, you can no longer raise private money. Uh, you run your campaign exclusively on that public grant. Uh, partial grant, Minnesota is the only state that has uh, one of these for legislative races. Um, this is a very similar model, but the grant is smaller and you are permitted to continue raising money from private sources uh, with restrictions that are uh, lower contribution limits and, and overall spending amounts for your campaign. The small, the small donor match and the voucher programs have seen a lot of action recently. Um, the small donor match um, was done in New York City in the late 90s uh, and is um, has been evolving uh, over the years and is also being adopted in many other um, places, including New York State now. Uh, in their upcoming election will be their first election of small donor matching funds, uh, but it's also been adopted in a couple of counties in Maryland and elsewhere in the country. Uh, what you have here are, um, you can raise money from, you, sign, you opt in again. Uh, oftentimes you are subjected to overall spending limits for your campaign. Uh, the, um, the idea here is that you incentivize candidates to go through um, individual donors, usually in their district, in their like city council district or something, uh, and raise money from small dollar donors, people that are giving $5 or $10 or $50. Uh, and then that donation gets matched if it meets the correct criteria. Uh, in New York City, I think that match is currently nine to one. Uh, and so you can raise $100. I think $100 still qualifies in New York City uh, and as a small donation. And then the, the city will give you another $900 on top of that. And what happens is the candidates then will campaign differently. And this, um, like other kinds of election reforms, um, this kind of a campaign finance reform is meant to try to get candidates to uh, be more representative of their constituencies. Uh, the voucher program is new in Seattle, uh, new as of a few years ago. Uh, that is the first jurisdiction that I'm aware of to adopt this kind of a program. The campaign finance agency sends out uh, vouchers of $25 each and to registered voters in the city. Uh, and each voter gets four of those $25 vouchers and then they can give them to whatever candidate they'd like. And then the candidate turns those vouchers in um, or, or four different candidates or however the, the voter wants to split that up uh, and get the money uh, from those vouchers. So those are the main uh, regulations around campaign finance, uh, efforts to sort of cap um, outsized donations, uh, to make candidates more representative of their constituencies, and to make sure that we can see what's happening in the elections. So it seems like with uh, on the public funding side, there, there really aren't a lot of jurisdictions who are doing any sort of public funding based on this list you provided here. Yeah, at the state level, that's definitely true. Um, so we've got uh, five basically right now, uh, the, those three with the full grants, uh, Minnesota with the partial grant, uh, and then uh, New York State with their upcoming um, small donor match program. Although we haven't seen what that looks like uh, yet in action um, because this will be their first election uh, next year with that in place. Yeah, I, I wonder if there are, um you know, more states or cities who are considering adding these types of features or even switching completely to publicly funded elections. Uh, uh, jurisdictions are not permitted to switch entirely to publicly funded elections. Ah. Uh, they do have to give the option for a candidate to um, campaign in the traditional way. Uh, however, uh, many local jurisdictions are considering moving to uh, small donor matching funds or, or voucher programs. Uh, 
I don't have a comprehensive list because we don't uh, collect uh, local data comprehensively, although we sure. do in a few places. Um, but that is absolutely where the movement is taking place uh, primarily uh, right now in in public funding uh, reforms specifically and largely in campaign finance reforms. This is what um, this is where the momentum is, is trying to get small donor representation. Right. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, how different kinds of people and groups engage in campaigns and what the trends are. Um, and this can inform uh, kind of what uh, sorts of campaign finance reforms might be most appropriate in a, in a given area. Um, individuals and organizational donors to campaigns behave very differently. Uh, individuals will give money to candidates that they support um, just based on um, liking that candidate, um, based on their policy, um, uh, maybe they have a personal relationship, that sort of thing. Um, increasingly, individuals are giving to candidates that do not represent them geographically. And so we're seeing the nationalization of federal and state politics, um, particularly through uh, platforms like WinRed and ActBlue, uh, which are um, passed through uh, organizations that allow you to make contributions to candidates elsewhere in the country very easily uh, online. And so uh, we're seeing uh, that happening uh, in increasing amounts. <clears throat> In 2020, uh, we were seeing some record out-of-state contribution totals, um, even from smaller donors uh, in, in many states, uh, such as Iowa and just other places where um, there were high-profile races happening at the state level. Yeah, I have to say, I, I know that, you know, on my own Facebook news feed and that sort of thing, I, I probably got more ads from uh, popular candidates outside of my state um, asking for donations than I did from sure. from candidates near where I lived. Uh, um, and I, th I think that's, yeah, just becoming more and more prevalent. If you click on those links to make that donation, uh, that donation usually does go through uh, Act Blue, for example, mm. if it's a Democratic candidate or, or uh, increasingly WinRed, which is a newer platform for the, Re for the Republican candidates. Um, corporations and uh, corporations uh, specifically give a little bit differently. Um, they don't tend to care, uh, unlike individuals who give a, who care quite a bit about um, making contributions to people that are of that individual's political party. Uh, corporations tend not to care about the political party of a candidate. AT&T is the biggest contributor in our state level campaign finance data directly to campaigns. Uh, AT&T gives almost exactly 50% to Republican and Democratic candidates. Uh, they give about 95% of their money to incumbents. Uh, and this is the typical model for a profile, for a profile, <clears throat> excuse me, for-profit corporation uh, or its political action committees. Uh, in some states, by the way, uh, a group like AT&T, a corporation or a union uh, can make contributions directly to candidates without forming a political action committee. So it just comes from their treasury uh, at the federal level. And in, um, in about half of the states, um, the corporations and unions, uh, although they can spend on those independent expenditures we talked about are prohibited from making contributions directly to candidates uh, from their treasuries. They form a political action committee, uh, which is then funded by um, individuals associated, associated with that company. Usually executives, board members, that sort of thing that are each giving a lot of money to the PAC and the PAC contributes in the interests of that corporation or union. Um, those interests uh, almost ubiquitously just give across the aisle <clears throat> and give to incumbents. Incumbents are making policy Incumbents win about 95% of the time or so uh, if they're running for re-election, and so they will continue to make policy. And the uh, motivations for contributions from these interests are to be at the table when decisions are being made. Uh, unions uh, have a similar interest, and they give in a similar way, although they do lean more democratic in their contributions, um, but often will make contributions to Republican uh, office holders if it is necessary uh, in the context of Republicans basically controlling the politics in the state. Um, once you're an incumbent, uh, you get to raise a lot of money. So this is a breakdown that we have on our Open Secrets website of uh, fundraising uh, by incumbency status. So you can see here uh, the average amount raised by federal incumbents in, in U.S. Senate races is $28 million plus. If you're challenging the incumbent, you can expect to raise about $5 million. So a very big difference there. This is true for US House races. Uh, it is also true at the state level. Uh, this is a query on the Follow the Money website, which I'll pull up here. 
of contributions to candidates for state legislative office. Um, specifically, uh, gubernatorial candidates can really kind of throw patterns off, um, if, particularly if they self-finance to a large degree. <clears throat> so we're looking at legislative candidates to normalize the database. And you can see, again, uh, incumbents who are winners uh, raised a lot of the money here, $674 million out of $1.3 billion, so about half. Uh, and this is pretty normal. You'll also note that the, the, the losers who are trying to challenge them, raising about a third of the money, raise that money with more contributions. If you divide the dollar amount by the number of records here, you're, you're noticing that the average contribution to these incumbents is higher um, per transaction. And that is largely because they're raising more money from institutional donors, you know, corporations, unions, political action committees, and that sort of thing. Typically when a candidate runs for office for the first time, uh, they will raise money largely from individuals. Uh, and then once they win, the contributions begin coming in from the political action committees and other institutional donors um, almost right away. That's interesting because, you know, at, at CES, we talk a lot about our voting methods and the way that um, only being able to choose one candidate on your ballot uh, limits, limits what we can say. And it also really puts a disadvantage on um, third parties, independents, just, you know, new candidates who come in with fresh ideas, right? Um, and so then we can see how on top of that, the, the political spending and the way that our, um, our elections are funded just even further disadvantages those, um, those people who are trying to come in with, with new ideas um, and their, the, the status quo, right, is, is what's, what's being, uh, all, the, all the money is being poured into. That's absolutely true, um, particularly with contributions to campaigns and oftentimes with the money spent on lobbying. Um, much of the money spent on lobbying won't be uh, spent to support a change in policy, but to ensure that um, people who are trying to reform a policy, such as per, uh, perhaps uh, prohibiting fracking or something like that, uh, will not be successful. Um, right. the, the money will just be there to make sure that the status quo stays. Yeah. Um, independent expenditures are a little different. Uh, they are typically uh, made by uh, nonprofit corporations, frankly, at this point, um, although it used to be a little bit more of uh, for-profit corporations and unions getting directly involved. Uh, um, it's hard for us to see who is funding uh, the nonprofit corporations uh, because, again, they don't have to disclose their donors um, publicly, although they do to the IRS, uh, which has a habit of keeping tax information secret. Um, most uh, campaign finance agencies don't require a meaningful disclosure of funders of nonprofit corporations. Uh, and those that do try to get those nonprofit corporations to disclose their funders often get thwarted by um, people engaging in a practice of creating a shell game where the nonprofit corporation will receive money from another nonprofit corporation and then make an expenditure. And so when they, when they report a donor, it's just another opaque name like Americans for America or something like that. Um, where we have been able to see where that funding is coming from, though, it looks like it is largely from wealthy individuals uh, and also from, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, from trade associations uh, like Chamber of Commerce or retailers uh, or realtors um, or from unions. Uh, but largely wealthy individuals are funding um, this outside spending from what we can tell. Uh, that kind of spending um, has then uh, the kinds of motivations behind it that individuals have with their campaign contributions as well. Uh, these will be used to support a specific candidate oftentimes. Uh, and we see this a lot with candidate specific super PACs at the federal level where you just have a, a super PAC that pops up and supports a candidate throughout the campaign. Um, and um, the, um, the independent expenditures aren't used in quite the same way as contributions. Contributions uh, are made kind of across the board. Independent expenditures, particularly when you get into the state level, uh, do not tend to target every candidate that's up for election. Uh, they tend to target candidates that have made a very high profile vote. Um, so for example, in uh, the Colorado State Senate a few years ago, uh, after the Aurora Court, uh, shooting there, uh, there was a bill uh, in the Senate to restrict gun access. A couple of senators voted for it. Uh, and the NRA came in with a lot of independent expenditures uh, to recall those senators and was successful in doing that. Um, the other uh, way that independent spending is used is to try to um, target very specific races that are very competitive particularly if you have a competitive legislative chamber. So if you, if you can flip a Senate or protect your slim majority in a Senate, 
um, then independent expenditures will rise very high. Um, one of the questions that we get a lot is whether uh, elections are getting more expensive. Uh, and the answer, the short answer is yes. So this is a, a report that we published um, as the National Institute of Money and Politics and the Center for Responsive Politics um, before the merger, <clears throat> excuse me, before the merger. Uh, this is fundraising by federal candidates. Uh, these bars uh, represent partisan fundraising uh, in four-year um, different cycles. So uh, candidates in elections in 2020 and elections in 2016 and elections in 2012 for a comparable election cycle. And you can see the 2020 fundraising was far and away above um, prior uh, presidential election years uh, for federal campaigns. Uh, for state campaigns, it was a little less, um, it's been a little less clear, uh, although the dollar amounts are going up. Um, at the time that we wrote this, we didn't have all the state data in yet. Uh, so this was our projection for 2020. The actual amount came in uh, around in here. Uh, so still an increase, but, but smaller than this chart looks like. <clears throat> we didn't see the uh, end of the election year push uh, that we often do, probably because of a lack of fundraising events because of COVID. Um, uh, but we are seeing the dollar amounts continue to go up. Uh, where states have public funding programs, uh, we still see the dollar amounts tend to go up. Uh, and so that doesn't really make that uh, a static uh, dollar amount. Uh, even adjusted for inflation, uh, we, we still see increases there. Uh, and part of that is that the states will increase the size of, say, their grants um, to, to try to keep up with um, what other candidates are raising uh, so that candidates continue to opt into the public funding program. And do you all have theories or thoughts on why it's continuing to increase? Um, part of it is certainly, um, a large part of it is certainly the engagement of small donors. Uh, and what mm -hmm. we're seeing here is uh, increased polarization in the country, <clears throat> which leads to um, stronger motivations for people to get engaged in the, um, in the process and make contributions to candidates. Uh, some of the, um, the candidates that have set record fundraising um, levels uh, in Congress, for example, are uh, AOC, um, who has motivated mm -hmm. people on the far left quite a bit. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, has shattered some records for first quarter uh, off-year fundraising, uh, and obviously she's motivating a lot of people on the right, uh, and this is part of what's really driving that increase. And so it sounds like it's, it's the, the, these increases are coming more from the individual donors and not necessarily an increase in spending from the corporate donors or the PACs. Yeah, so uh, specifically, um, with those increases, what I'm talking about are the contributions uh, to the candidates, <clears throat> and that is true. Uh, the individual donors seem to be uh, causing that to go up quite a bit. Uh, corporations and other um, really established interests tend to have kind of a budget that they mm. that they have, <laughs> and then right. uh, and they they're going to yeah, they're going to stick with that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and they are also uh, in in jurisdictions with contribution limits. They tend to give the limit. Uh, mm -hmm. if it isn't exorbitantly high. So for example, at the federal level, the limit uh, is around, uh, it's adjusted for inflation. I think this year it's 28 or $2,900 um, per election. So once in the primary and then again in the general. Um, and uh, these interests will give that uh, to, the to the candidate and then they can't give more, but they'll just give it to all the incumbents. <clears throat> uh, independent expenditures are a different story. Uh, again, they aren't subject to any kind of a limitation, and this is a breakdown of independent expenditures uh, from outside groups, so we're excluding party committees engaging this kind of activity uh, at the federal level, and you can see that this has been uh, generally going up. Uh, it is best when looking at a chart like this um, to visually compare um, four years apart, uh, so 2012, 2016, and 2020 are comparable elections as are 10, 14, and, and 18, and so we're seeing a consistent increase here. Uh, if this is going to hold for 22, we can expect to see a bar kind of up around here for 2022. Uh, and that is absolutely driving up the costs a lot, as you can see. Yeah, I, I can't get over that, the, the 2020, just how, um, what, what an exponential increase that is there compared to the rest. There were two um, very big um, motivations for this. <clears throat> One was that we had a, um, a presidential contest that uh, A, was inspiring a lot of people to get involved um, because of uh, the, the nature of the candidates, uh, and B, uh, we um, was perceived to be competitive. Uh, 
as opposed to some of the presidential races where it hasn't been uh, as competitive. This one was seen to be pretty competitive throughout the, the course of the election, which spawned increasing amounts of spending as the election went on. Uh, another reason that this went up is because the US Senate uh, was perceived to be on the on the line. So again, a flippable chamber mm -hmm. uh, will, will cause substantial increases here. Um, I do want to uh, show uh, at least one tool here uh, to try to make some of this uh, data meaningful for people who are doing advocacy on the ground. And I'm going to step away from um, campaign finance reforms specifically, um, but go into um, trying to work on an issue in your state legislature. I'm going to our followthemoney.org website. This is the website from the National Institute of Money and Politics. This website will eventually go away and uh, all of our information will be hosted on our Open Secrets website, um, but we're still working on that and it is way off. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate this here. If I go to this menu in the upper left corner and then tools, we can look at uh, this power mapping tool. <clears throat> I'm just gonna take a moment here to pull up uh, California. Uh, I, uh, I have to admit we're behind on some of the updates that we're doing for our office holders for 2021 as part of the merger, um, which as you can imagine is, is uh, taking a lot of time for us. Uh, so I'm going to go to 2020 uh, to get updated or to get comprehensive information here. Um, what we're looking at is a power mapping chart uh, that can be used to supplement uh, power maps that groups are, in, groups are making to work on the issues that they work on. Uh, right now we're looking at a, an X, uh, uh, the x-axis of uh, supporting or opposing a specific issue and a y-axis of how much decision-making power the legislator or, or uh, governor has in that issue. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that once we get this into a more readable uh, kind of a format here. Uh, what I'm going to do is instead of having all of the um, members of the legislature uh, and, and the governor in this chart, I'm going to limit this to a specific legislative committee. And in this case, I'm going to go with the House Assembly, um, the California Assembly Labor Committee. Let me blow this up a little bit. So each one of these dots here now represents a member of this legislative committee. And they are on, all on the zero um, point part of the x-axis because we haven't <clears throat> suggested that, that what issue they might be supporting or opposing, so we don't know yet. They're on the y-axis uh, in different places because of things like chairing the committee or chairing a lot of committees or being on a lot of committees versus somebody who's uh, probably a, a newer uh, legislator doesn't have as much uh, power in the legislature from what we can tell in our database. Um, on this uh, California uh, Assembly Labor and Employment Committee, uh, uh, perhaps this committee is considering a piece of legislation uh, that would um, require uh, union contractors to um, build um, certain things uh, uh, related to business construction or something. Uh, so we can grab our industries here. And let's say that we've got, um, this is our economic classifications of donors. And so what we're going to be doing here is looking at how much money these, legislator, <clears throat> these legislators got, the members of this committee from these different industries. And so we can do uh, things like, uh, this is a gradient of oppose or support on a piece of legislation. We're, I'm going to suggest that the general business um, sector is, is opposed to this. They don't want to necessarily hire uh, union contractors to build their buildings for them. Um, but then the general trade associations uh, are very much in support of this legislation. I'll go down to the labor sector and get more specific. We have a multi-tier classification system here, so we can get into the labor a little bit further. And then uh, let's go with general trade. Unions are very supportive of this piece of legislation. And then we can update this. And this is going to move these legislators um, based on where they get the money. And so you can take a look at people who may be close um, to even on the money that they've received from these industries. You can click on the dot and see that money and why this person is uh, where they are on the chart. And you can even uh, click into this and get into the data behind the, the money and see which specific contributors there were. Um, but I wanna highlight this as a tool that we built specifically for advocates um, who may be working on an issue that is maybe before a legislative committee to see where they might be able to sway somebody over to their side of an issue or shore up support for somebody who may be um, somebody that they need to talk to where the campaign finance might be able to highlight that for them. 
among other reasons that a legislator may, may switch a vote on a piece of legislation. Uh, I'll send out, uh, Caitlin, I'll send you links to a couple of other things that are um, trying to help us make the data come to life too for people who are actually doing work. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we're trying to do with this campaign finance data uh, in terms of getting even outside of elections and, and campaign finance specifically. So. Yeah, this is fabulous. I, I can see this being incredibly useful for advocates and yeah, people trying to advance different <clears throat> issues. Um, and it's it's it would be interesting even just as a citizen, if you know, oh, there's you know a, a specific bill coming up in my legislature. I wonder how the folks on X committee might vote on that or where they're getting their money from, you know. Um, yeah, that, that is awesome. We had a, a, a fantastic, I forget her name, this was a few years ago now, um, and we found that online there was a, a woman who was just a, a local advocate, I believe, uh, who went before a committee in West Virginia, which is where she lived, um, that was considering um, a, an energy issue, and it was related to, to fracking in West Virginia, I believe. Uh, and she just went into the uh, legislative hearing and started reading all the donations from the industry to each of the legislators um, and was actually forcibly removed uh, from the from the hearing. But it was inspirational to see people get in there and get engaged. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but with that, I'll open up the Q&A if that works. So. Yep, absolutely. I have pulled um, the vari various questions. If anybody has additional questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and stick them in the chat. This will probably be your last your last call. I've got quite a few here um, and we're already approaching the hour. If if we need to go five or so minutes over, would that be okay for you, Pete? I'm available as long as you need me. Okay, great. Um, so T.E. Sumner asked, um, I think this was during the, the disclosure uh, part of the presentation, they asked, are there any restrictions by address or employment? I think of the, um, you know, the types of individuals or, uh, yeah, the, the types of individuals who are donating to campaigns. Yeah, so uh, this is a great question. It has to do with um, disclosure of, of how the political process is being engaged. Uh, versus privacy of the individual donors. Uh, there are a couple of states where you cannot actually get the addresses uh, and a few states where you can't get the employment information of the donors. Um, Wyoming is a state where all we get is the name of the person in the town. Uh, mm. It makes it very difficult for us to tell who's actually funding elections in that state. Um, uh, Texas does require uh, contributor addresses to be reported, but they don't make them publicly available, um, which kind of defeats the purpose from our end. Um, uh, and then there are other um, states that just don't have occupation employer information um, that is required to be reported, although other states do require addresses to be reported and make them available uh, um, publicly. <clears throat> uh, the use for this information uh, is that, uh, for example, with us, we will, um, let me do a quick share again here, um, we will use address information to uh, be able to tell you who um, somebody gave to. So, Steve Bullock. This is our Montana governor. I'm actually gonna look at him in the context of being a contributor um, because he's made some campaign contributions. Uh, but this is a page uh, for him. We have an ID number for him, just as we do for any other person or group uh, who is engaged in the political process. Um, it allows us to tie together all of these different activities that he's involved in. So we can see the offices that he's run for, uh, which offices he's held, <clears throat> which independent spending has targeted him, contributions that he's made, uh, and he's made quite a few. Uh, and uh, we are able to tie this together because we know that Steve Bullock at this address or this series of addresses is Steve mm -hmm. Bullock. And so that's, uh, that's how we use the address information. We actually don't share it publicly ourselves, uh, to be honest right. with you. Um, but um, that is how we uh, use the address information. And then the employment information is uh, helpful for, for us in terms of looking at industries of contributors uh, mm -hmm. and um, also for people who are engaged in campaign finance enforcement actions to make sure that uh, say an employer isn't requiring employees to make political contributions. You see changes in patterns when that happens. Got it. So fascinating, all of the things you can do with this data. Yeah. Um, SAS asked, I, I, I like this question, how strong is the correlation between the winner of an election and the candidate who raised the most money in that race? Do you have data on that? Yeah, um, there is a um, a strong correlation there. Uh, the strongest correlation itself comes from, uh, I'm trying to pull up a chart if I can find it uh, quickly here. Uh, the strongest correlation comes from incumbency. Uh, incumbency also um, has a very strong correlation with raising the most money. Mm. Um, the, 
Let's see. This is me not being able to type and talk at the same time. In the same way, it's okay. <laughs> we will not judge you. Um, certainly, if you don't, uh, if you are not the, um, uh, if you are not the incumbent and do not raise the most money, uh, your chances of winning an election are about five percent. Um, wow. Uh, if uh, if you're in an open race, if you're challenging an incumbent, it's even less. Um, the um, it's just a, it's, you can't win that way. You have to have one of those advantages typically to win the election. And uh, typically, uh, the, uh, if you don't have the incumbency advantage, uh, if you're in an open race and you're the top fundraiser, uh, you win, I think it was around 72% uh, of the time, uh, you will win with that monetary advantage in a case where there is no incumbent. If there's an incumbent, wow. the incumbent wins about 95% of the time. Yeah. Uh, there's also a difference in where you get your money from. Um, mm. If you're running for the first time and you're getting in your money from a variety of sources, uh, particularly a variety of individuals, or, or if you actually get some institutional donors, that helps you. Uh, a lot of people will run for election the first time and finance their own campaigns. Um, people that self-finance tend not to do very well, um, although there are some very notable exceptions. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see why that would be the case because part of raising money means that you have to be talking to people, right? So you're, you're getting the word out as you're asking yep. folks uh, to donate. Um, uh, the little known, uh, a little reported fact <clears throat> was that Donald Trump's 2016 election actually set the record for the most small donors um, wow. to a presidential campaign. Uh, the, the media coverage was very much about how he was self-financing, which was true at the start, but it was mostly in the form of loans to his campaign. Uh, and then uh, after the, or late in the primary uh, convention season, um, small donors really started pouring in uh, and he actually broke uh, the 2008 Obama record at the time. Uh, and I believe Biden broke his... Um, 16 record. Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> all right. And then we've got a question from Howard. What is the difference between PACs and super PACs? Yeah. So a super PAC is a kind of a PAC. Uh, so when we're talking about a political action committee here, uh, we're talking about uh, a political committee that is set up to receive contributions uh, and then make contributions or expenditures uh, to political recipients, candidates, and that sort of thing. Um, a super PAC is a colloquial term. It doesn't actually have a legal definition, but what it is uh, at, the, at the FEC for federal elections, um, there is a regulatory label for it that is called an independent expenditure only committee. Uh, that doesn't mm -hmm. roll off the tongue that well. So super PACs is what's usually used. Um, these are PACs that um, will not make contributions directly to candidates. Uh, and uh, a traditional political action committee will raise money and make contributions to candidates, may also engage in some independent expenditure activity, um, but uh, how much money that PAC can raise from any particular donor is limited um, because of contribution limits to candidates. And uh, when a political action committee makes contributions to candidates, uh, it itself is subject to contribution limits uh, so that you don't have somebody giving huge amounts of money to candidates through a second um, committee like this. Uh, super PACs, um, because they do not make contributions to candidates uh, and are only engaged in making independent expenditures, uh, can raise as much money from any donor as they'd like. Uh, and this was uh, the result of a Supreme Court case. Uh, I think it was a Supreme Court case, it may have been an appellate court case, uh, after uh, Citizens United as kind of a follow up to that decision. So, in general, and I think you may have mentioned this earlier when you were talking about the um, different types of donors and different types of contributions. But when you're talking about those independent expenditures, we can think about um, the, the various campaign ads that we see during election time that aren't actually from the candidate's campaign. They're from Americans for America, like you said earlier, or something That's like right. that. So yep. they can spend tons and tons of money advertising for a candidate without actually donating to that candidate's campaign. Yeah, and there's a lot of money to be made um, right now if you're a campaign finance lawyer in what um, coordination with a candidate is. Um, so definitely if you're uh, writing a check to a candidate, that's a contribution. Um, right. If you're running the ad uh, and not talking with the candidate at all ever um, about it or, the, or anybody associated with the campaign, uh, that's pretty in, independent of the campaign and not subject to any kind of a limit. There's a lot of gray area though in how much communication you may or may not have with the candidate. Uh, and right. Uh, at some point, uh, coordination becomes an in-kind contribution, a contribution mm -hmm. of something of value other than money, uh, and maybe subject to contribution limits. But that line is difficult to really pin down, um, and yeah. lawyers have a lot of fun with it. Yes, sounds like a very blurry area for sure. Um, 
Next, we've got a question from Frank who asks, what would the Disclose Act do if it's enacted? They say this is Title uh, Four of the Four of the People Act. Do you know about the Disclose Act? Um, only very generally. Uh, I, I don't feel comfortable going into the details of the Disclose Act, uh, unfortunately. Sure. Sorry. No, nope. that's okay. It's it's always much better to to state when you're not sure of something than to give incorrect uh, information. So it has been um, reintroduced a few times too. So or. or different kinds of versions of it. So yeah. I, I get them a little mixed up. Gotcha. All right. Well, Frank, you might have to do a little bit of digging on your own on, on Google for that. Um, I might um, be able to follow up with somebody else at our Open Secrets organization that has traditionally focused more on the federal um, campaign finance um, as well. So Caitlin, I can follow up with you on, on that too uh, and, and get an answer. Sure, that would be awesome, actually. Um, then Bobby asked, do you have any data to show how much money foreign individuals uh, or corporations contribute to US election campaigns? Yeah, so um, the only, so foreign individuals, uh, if you are, uh, foreign individuals and foreign corporations are ostensibly prohibited from making contributions to um, partisan political campaigns, um, but defining a foreign corporation can be difficult. Um, uh, corporations may be uh, incorporated in different places or have different parts of them incorporated in different places. Um, individuals who are U.S. citizens and living abroad are permitted to make contributions to U.S. political campaigns. Um, we don't have data on foreign individuals making contributions to campaigns. Again, that is ostensibly prohibited, um, although you could potentially do that through a dark money group. Uh, and so um, getting involved in those independent expenditures because we can't see who the donors are could potentially include some foreign money. Um, we wouldn't be able to tell though. Um, there are, um, the Open Secrets website does have um, a foreign lobbying uh, registration. Uh, so this is a FARA foreign agent um, registration um, uh, database. And so you can actually see who's involved in lobbying um, and uh, there'll be some, some information there about those uh, foreign groups that are trying to influence the policies. Good to know. Um, all right, we've got, I've got four more questions here um, from Tyler. To the extent that you can see based on anecdotes, press, ethics complaints, or investigations, how common is illegal campaign coordination between candidate campaigns and PACs controlled by unions or corporations? So that, that's kind of related to uh, what we were just talking about with that fine line, right, um, mm -hmm. on the super PACs. Uh, it is very rare that we see an actual uh, settlement or successful litigation around the coordination issue. Uh, and so uh, the only answer that I can really give is that it um, isn't common in the form of being found to be illegal. <laughs> so um, uh, it's difficult though to um, document conversations sometimes. Uh, and the level of coordination can vary even from jurisdiction to jurisdiction what's permitted. Uh, so, for example, uh, there are states where you might, as a candidate, choose to shoot some B-roll footage and put it out there for independent campaigns to use uh, for independent expenditures and that sort of thing. Um, or uh, uh, one of the things that can happen <clears throat> is that independent expenditure activities will take place, and then the group will talk to the candidate about it, uh, like there's more where that came from or something, uh, and, and, or, or it could even be a threat. There was a great uh, report out of the uh, Moritz College of Law at the University of Ohio um, a few years ago where they interviewed um, former Congress people. Uh, this was, uh, they weren't identifying who they were, so um, there's that to note. Um, but um, some of the conversation there was that groups would come into the office and say, we, this is our independent expenditure budget, but we're not, you know, we're not coordinating with you um, about, about that. So, so it's, it's a fine line and really blurry. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like there are so many ways for there to be kind of loopholes and, and backroom deals with, with all of this, right? It's just, it's hard to track. Um, and the, um, the, yeah, the existence, especially of the, the so-called super PACs makes it especially difficult. The, um, the name of that report, if anybody's interested, you can Google it and, and actually get a copy of it, is called The New Soft Money. The New Soft Money. I'm gonna make a note of that real quick so that I can remember to include it um, in the follow-up email if folks wanna check it out. 
Okay. Um, all right. Then we've got another question from SAS who asks, does Open Secrets slash Follow the Money have any APIs for accessing its data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll show, do a quick screen share here. Um, the uh, actually I have a post-it note here to learn more about our API through the Open Secrets website. So I'm not that familiar with it yet. Um, but uh, on the Follow the Money website, if I go to our data and APIs, uh, this website has basically the ability to write SQL queries in it with through the interface rather than knowing SQL. So you can ask the database essentially anything you might want to ask it and get an answer. Uh, and the answer is something that you can export. You can download data, uh, a table, for example, or you can stream data through an API. And for those of you who may not know what an API is, we're talking about an application program interface. Um, this allows you to stream raw data from one, one website to another. Uh, it doesn't have to be a table, although it can be. Uh, I'm going to click on examples here uh, and show a couple of my favorites. Uh, WRAL is a public radio station in North Carolina that publishes a lot of online articles. Uh, they are streaming our data through the Follow the Money API. Uh, this is an article from 2015 when they announced that they started doing this. Uh, and if they mention a sitting legislator, such as at the time, House Speaker Tim Moore, you can mouse over that person's name and get their top five donors. Uh, and so this is just streaming from the website. It's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, and there are others. Um, uh, I'll show uh, just one more here from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Um, where they have put together an amazing tool in Georgia about um, legislative members with lots of information about who those members are. You get to look at a bunch of, uh, this is almost creepy how many faces we see, but we'll just <laughs> click on, um, click on uh, Tyler Paul Smith here. Uh, so this is information, oh, this is a bad example. Um, oh, I wonder if this one is broken. There we go. Um, Stephen Tarvin, uh, so we got lots of information about his district and that sort of thing that they've put together over at the at the Journal Constitution. And then here's their top, uh, however many donors you want to look at. Um, so. Awesome. And SAS says, this is perfect, thank you. So mm -hmm. knowing SAS, um, they are probably going to um, get right on that and, and start using one of your APIs for something. Yeah, absolutely reach on. out. Um, we've, we work with people to kind of get them started. Uh, the building, the actual the API is kind of on the user, um, but we're happy to talk about like how, how the data works, uh, how best to get what you need. Uh, the most recent one I was working with, I think was um, the St. Louis uh, Post-Gazette. Um, they have a new API that streams our data that allows you to look for contributions to sitting office holders in, 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 in Missouri. So. Got it, that's great. Um, okay, I've just got two more questions. Uh, Shane asked, is there a consensus on the best public <clears throat> funding model? Um, so uh, Open Secrets, I need to note, uh, only advocates for enhanced transparency. So we advocate for more disclosure, but we don't advocate for any other particular kinds of reforms, uh, including contribution limits or public funding. Uh, and what I mean here uh, with this presentation is to talk about just kind of where the action is uh, and what sure. the effects are. Um, that said, uh, there uh, are experiments happening. Public funding is where experimentation is happening a lot right now uh, with the small donor matching programs, uh, including uh, variations on what constitutes a small donor. Do they have to be in your district versus outside? Uh, what the match rate is, one to one, six to one, nine to one, um, and how that impacts how candidates actually go out and try to raise money. Um, and it isn't that the donor is going to write or not write a $5 check to a candidate because they're going to get matched so much as the candidate is going to campaign differently and try right. to get the money from different places. Um, the voucher program, I think, uh, is being considered uh, in other localities as well. That one's from Seattle. Uh, it will be interesting to see how these play out. Uh, and there is academic research going on on um, looking at demographic information about donors and how representative the donor pool is of the electorate for a candidate. And um, with these different adoptions of programs, we'll get to see how the specifics of each program sort of impact what the outcome is. Yeah, there's, uh, like you said, there's lots of experimentation going on. A lot of these reforms are still relatively new. So we we have a lot more to learn. Um, and the more states and jurisdictions that sign on to this, the, the better the data will be, of course. More data points, yeah. Yep. Um, okay, and I, I said I had two more questions. Someone just put another one that I think is interesting in, in the chat. So now we, we still have two more questions. Sure. Um, Andrea said, I recently learned about a major city that implemented robust campaign finance reform. 
as an unintended consequence, it successfully removed economic barriers to run, but increased vote splitting due to the larger candidate pools. Has Open Secret studied or reported on this unintended consequence? I'm sorry. I, and so does, could you repeat oh, that for me? Sure. It's, it's a long question. So uh, essentially, she's asking um, about campaign finance reform, removing barriers for candidates to run, but then because those barriers are removed, um, the larger you have a larger candidate pool that results in more vote splitting. Um, so vote, for anybody, for you, Pete, or for anybody who is in the audience and doesn't know what vote splitting is, it's essentially when you have lots of candidates, multiple candidates who are who are kind of fighting over the same voter base. So say you have five candidates who all have relatively similar platforms, and so they're fighting over the same voter base and um, what happens is that votes get split among all of those candidates and often you end up with a winner who has a fraction of a small fraction of the vote right not an overwhelming majority or even overwhelming <laughs> plurality right. um and so she, she's just asking whether any of these kind of unintended election consequences um, have been studied at all by open secrets uh, so we haven't studied those directly, although we do log vote totals for candidates, um, at least for the uh, state candidates that are coming from the Follow the Money website, uh, and to some extent for the federal candidates uh, coming from the uh, Center for Response Politics. Um, and so it is possible to do that kind of a research, um, but I, I'm not familiar with it. So. Sure. Um, however, this is also where the kinds of election reforms that that your organization works on yes. are, are coming in and impacting things. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I think, you know, most most folks are interested in getting campaign finance reform implemented because um, they can see how it, certain individuals or certain corporations can have an outsized influence on our elections, right? Um, but at the same time, like Andrea pointed out, it can cause other unintended consequences. Um, and so if we can implement something like approval voting on top of campaign finance reform, that would be that would be a dream in, in, my, in my world. Um, all right, so then Jeff asks, what happens if you discover that an election winner violated the campaign finance laws? Do you rerun the election? Uh, so it is un, unusual, but not unheard of for that to happen. Uh, typically, this takes the form of receiving contributions that exceed a contribution limit. Uh, um, that actually happens pretty commonly, uh, and there are different remedies for it. Um, the reason it happens uh, commonly is because a contributor may not be aware of or may not personally care about the contribution limit and, and make a contribution to a campaign that is above the limit. Um, the campaign will typically accept all contributions. Uh, and then go through and review for those that exceed the limit. Uh, and the first uh, remedy for this is to return the excess part of the contribution, um, which is common. And that's typically what happens. Uh, actually, in our database, we'll end up then with a returned transaction amount too, so that we have a net total for that contributor. And that puts the candidate or the committee into compliance. Um, that's usually where it ends. Um, we see candidates are watching each other's campaigns a lot. And so these yeah. kinds of violations come up um, usually pretty quickly. Um, but there are cases where um, where that is uh, where, where somebody has broken the law uh, and people do get in trouble for that um, the sure. president of the new york state senate went to, to jail for a while for for campaign finance violations um, but it isn't particularly common uh, if we see something in our database that looks suspicious the first thing that we do is verify the data um, so uh, a did we get it right or did we get it wrong uh, and then b uh, has the candidate made an amendment to the report um, have they returned the excess contribution and, and reported that in a strange way that we couldn't find it and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's our first step. Uh, we don't, uh, we are not an enforcement organization, right. um, but we do put the data out there for everybody to see. Uh, and yes. so people will actually see that uh, kind of stuff and bring it up. Oh, um, okay. And I do see, a, uh, sorry, somebody just messaged me saying that they had, oh, there it is. Yep. Sorry, Latifa. I, I accidentally skipped over her question. Um, so she asked, do you have any stats on U.S. citizens living abroad who donate to political campaigns here? Um, yes. Uh, I don't have any um, digested stats here, but our uh, database does include and publicly makes available uh, the state of the so the, the state reported for the address of the contributor um, on that donation and the city. Uh, and 
uh, in the event that it's a foreign contribution or a contribution from a foreign location, uh, you will find uh, something in there that isn't a state. Uh, and so you'll see like Paris and then some indication that it's France or one of the military zones um, is, is going to be a common, mm -hmm. uh, common address there. Right. Uh, so it's possible to, to look at that. Great. Uh, okay, in practice, wrote, it's a it's a small percentage, but but I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah, I would imagine that that's relatively rare, especially compared to yeah the overall number of donations that are coming in. Um, okay, well there was one more final question. This is this will be the last one, and then we'll cut it off. We're already about fifteen minutes over. I really appreciate your patience, um, but people are very interested in this subject, so I'm I'm glad to engage engage you and engage them. Um, if Open Secrets focuses on disclosure of donors, can you identify when a donor is not in the same jurisdiction of the candidate or where a measure is to be on the ballot, specifically extra jurisdictional donations? Yep. Uh, and so I'm just going to pull up um, a query here. I'm just going to look at contributions to state campaigns in Alaska in 2020. Uh, everything I'm doing here is actually something that can be done through the interface on the website, but for time constraints here, I'm just typing in the search. Here are contributions to candidates in Alaska uh, within state data, so state candidates um, uh, in the 2020 election. And then we can look at contributions from in-state or out-of-state. And so what this is doing is looking at whether or not the state on the transaction uh, for the contributor address uh, is AK and matches the state um, that the election is happening in. And then there are a few transactions here where um, we don't have any information about the state. Uh, and so we don't know if it's in state or out of state, but for the most part, we get a pretty good idea. And this is a pretty typical uh, kind of a breakdown. Um, although there are cases uh, where we will see a higher percentage of contributions coming from out of state. Uh, and actually, if we look at contributions to ballot measure campaigns, we will even more frequently see uh, contributions from out of state if the ballot measure is something like um, putting sugar labels on soft drinks or something like that um, uh, where corporate uh, or union contributions are really coming in from like headquarters that makes a lot of sense um so many so many good tools on your website um and this was uh such good information thank you so much for being here pete i really really appreciate your time and your expertise um, I know that you uh, you sent me the slides, so I'm going I'm going to include those uh, in a follow up email to everybody. And then um, Pete, would you also be able to send me kind of a list of any of the other websites that you showed during yeah. during the presentation, so folks can take a look at those. There are also some other organizations that are really helpful when looking at uh, what's happening with campaign finance and elections. Um, I'll give a shout out real quick to the Campaign Legal Center, uh, which is a great resource of lawyers. Uh, that is also a 501c3 charitable organization like we are uh, awesome. that is working with the public um, and typically with investigative journalists and the like to um, around legal uh, questions around campaign finance. So um, I'll send a few of those as well. Awesome. Uh, I'd, I'd like to note uh, for people here uh, with advocacy organizations that we often do um, tutorials, we'll walk a group through like how to use the website. So um, that's another kind of a presentation we're available for if you'd like to reach out. Wonderful. Um, and for all of you as well, if you're, whether you're new to uh, learning about um, elections, uh, Center for Election Science and approval voting, or if you've been around a while, you enjoyed this event, um, you know, we're talking about campaign finance, we're talking about donations. We need money to, to fund our work as well. So if this is something that you're really passionate about, um, I would definitely encourage you to check out our website and to potentially donate if, if you're feeling passionate about it. Um, and definitely take a look at the Open Secrets website. And either tomorrow or Friday, I will send out an email with this recording, the slides, and all of the other resources that Pete provided. Um, so thank you everyone uh, for being here. And thank you again, Pete. It was uh, fabulous having you. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for coming. This was, this was great. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful day.